Hello everyone, today I'm going to be showing you a surprise weapon against your opponent as white. And this opening is actually one of the major gambits that is so suicidal. It is extremely hard to prepare against and is also extremely wacky. And if your opponent doesn't know what he's doing, then your opponent's gonna fall into a trap easily, as you will see. But let's take you through this now and I hope that you'll enjoy it. So it's called the Italian Gambit and this opening is an extremely strong opening because the Italian Gambit is a line that is supposed to be better for black, it's white's gambit, but just one mistake can lead black to go the wrong way. But let's see what I mean by that. So here, e4 is played, e5, Knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4. This is the Italian game. And in the Italian opening, black has two moves to play, knight f6 or bishop c5. However, in the lower levels, and just saying this opening is best for younger and lower leveled players, um, knight f6 can be met with the fried liver during lower level games, but when your opponent plays bishop c5, you have a pretty neat weapon in stock. So most people know c3 is the main line, and if you're extremely familiar with the Joko Piano, then in classical games, go ahead and play c3. This is going to be the best position for sure. But back to the topic of this game, if you want to surprise your opponent in the blitz game, or you just want to make sh find out if your opponent is not doesn't know about the trap coming up, then you can play d4 straight away. And this is the Italian Gambit. And here there are a few moves for black to play. Firstly, there's no way for black not to accept. If black plays bishop d6 here, you can just take. And if you play knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes. And suddenly there's a move bishop takes f7. Because after king takes f7, white can play queen d5 check. Attacking both the king and the bishop. If the king comes up to protect the bishop, then there's this amazing move f4. And this move attacks the bishop, it prepares white's advance with e5, and it also threatens black's other pieces. In this position, if black played bishop d6, white can just play queen g5 check and pick up the queen. But other than that, we're not saying that playing bishop d6 or any declining move is the best. However, after d4, there are certain moves that are better than others. So now we enter the two main lines. There's knight takes d4, bishop takes d4. And e takes d4 is not good because after c3, we transpose back into the scotch game with bishop c4 and bishop c5. And this is known to be a good variation in the scotch for white. And if you are familiar with the scotch, then you should know that after knight f6, e5, d5, bishop b5, this position is an extremely dynamic position, but white should be better overall. So back here to d4, and if knight takes d4, it's usually met by the move b4. And the move b4 is extremely strong because it threatens the bishop, and if you take the knight here, then you can just take here immediately, attacking f7. So bishop takes b4 will be met by c3. And as you can see, that's a double attack. And after knight takes d4, you could also play knight takes e5 if you wanted to, but after queen e7, you cannot play knight takes f7 due to queen takes e4. And here, after something like king f1, this is playable, but after queen c2, queen c2, knight c2, knight h8, here the bishop is attacking g8, so knight f6. And after knight a3 or something, you can just take on a1. And in this position, as you can see, black, it's a 3v2 on the king side, but it's a 4v2 on the queen side. So black is completely up upon, and white's king on f1 is just weird. And if knight takes d4, this is why I recommend b4 in the first place. And if b4, if your opponent plays bishop takes b4 immediately, c3, and here your opponent's going to be forced to play knight f3 or he's going to be losing a piece. And finally, after b4, if the bishop drops back to b6, in this position you can take on e5. And the main reason for this is, look, after black tries the exact same thing as before, which is playing queen e7, 
then you can play knight takes f7, and after queen takes e4, you can play king f1, and after queen c2, queen c2, knight c2, knight h8, knight f6, in this position you have bishop b2. And after bishop b2, because the pawn is on b4 now, not on b2, so after knight takes a1, bishop takes a1, you can suddenly see that white is up a piece. And this piece will prevail in the future as this knight is not completely stuck. And this is why this position is slightly better for white. So knight takes d4 is also not the best move. The best move here, and if you're playing as black and you know this line, then you should know that bishop takes d4 is the best move. And here you should always play knight takes d4. That's, and after knight takes d4, because e takes d4 would just be weird. And in this position, you have a few moves to play. You have bishop e3, which is considered to be the best move, but if you're really wanting to play, with this gambit, then you should castle. And how does castling work? Well, black almost always plays knight of six in this position. And if black plays knight of six, you well, d6 is also moved, but usually transposes after f4. And actually, this position might be even worse than the previous one. But after knight of six, let's just say here, you should play bishop g5. And if your opponent is not cautious, they might think, oh, I'm up a pawn, but this pawn e4 is still an extremely big threat, guarding d5. However, if I play h6 here, forcing the bishop back, and I play g5, this will allow me to win this pawn, because after bishop g3, there's knight takes c4. Well, you can't really play knight takes c4 immediately, but you can play d6. And after d6, the c4 pawn is going to drop soon. Because after something like knight c3, c6, you're threatening d5, you can play bishop e6, queen e7, long castles. Block's completely fine here. However, after g5, white has a very deadly trap in this position. So take your time, and if you know about this, good. If you don't know about this, then this is a perfect time to calculate. What should white play here? Okay, if you found the answer, congratulations. The correct move in this position for white is f4. Now, to beginners, this would be the last move to calculate because two pawns attacking the square, the knight's very threatening, and you're opening up this diagonal. Whoops. Wow. Whoop. You're opening up this diagonal. But the main thing about this now is after f4 you're opening up that f file and that f7 pawn is always a weakness in this italian gambit so why is white winning after f4 well it all depends on black's major moves black has four main moves ef4 gh4 gf4 and probably the best move is d5 all right so let's go through a few moves that look good but they aren't whatsoever after knight e4, white can just play f takes c5. Bishop's attacking f7, queen's attacking d4. White's winning. d5 is the best move. But against d5, you can just take. And after g takes e4, f takes c5, knight takes d5, queen takes d4. This position still looks disastrous for black. Although, after bishop e6, black can still hang on. But white has a better position now. White is technically up a pawn because of these double h pawns. And white has much more active pieces, and white can play something like queen f2 to attack that pawn on f7. And finally, after f4, if gh4 immediately, this is where the trap comes in, fe5. Attacks d4, attacks f6, snipes f7, and here black has to play d5 again. But after d5, you can play e takes d5, knight takes d5, queen takes d4, this transposes. Or if we go back here, and you play e takes f4, then just queen takes d4 comes in and after castles, because if you take e takes f4, then suddenly rook takes f4 comes in, that knight's dropping, that pawn's dropping, white's completely winning in this position. So e takes f4 is the worst move, at least. And we come to the last move after f4, which is gf4. And after gf4, this is where the beautiful move comes in. White here plays rook takes f4. And gf4 is the big tester, but if you know about rook takes f4 in this position, then you're completely set. So why does sacrificing a rook work in this position? After you take the rook, white can take the knight. And after you take this knight, that knight's dropping. Whoa. That knight's dropping. And after this knight drops, the rook's gonna be threatened. So in this position, if you play something like d5, then just bishop takes f6, and bishop takes h8. 
And in this position, let's see, you're up two pieces, two minor pieces, and after you take this, you're still up a full piece in this position, and you're completely winning. So that's how this move f4, which seems completely crazy at first sight, is actually the best move here for white, and it's the main reason why white will get a better position in this position. However, after h6, which is still a good move instead, you can play d6 first, and here white should always play f4. After f4, black would most likely play bishop g4 against you. If your opponent plays castles, then you are already set in this position where bishop takes f6, g takes f6, and in blitz, this position is extremely hard to play as black. But in classical, this might not be the option to go for, and this is why I only recommend this line in blitz. But if you're really but if you really like weakening your opponent's position, even with the loss of a pawn, go ahead with this position. This is not a bad line. However, your opponent plays G bishop g4, it means that they have found the best move. Now, there is this extremely crazy line that leads to a very imbalanced equality, but I personally don't really like it. But if you're wondering what it is, it looks like this. Bishop takes f6. Bishop takes d1, bishop takes d8, rook takes d1. It looks like that white's going to be winning a piece. But here, after rook takes d1, there's knight takes c2. Which is why, in this position, c3 is actually the recommended move. But after c3, black can still play knight c2. And after rook takes d1, knight takes a1. Knight a3 traps that knight. e takes f4, rook takes a1, g5, bolstering this pawn. And as you can see, black has 8 pawns and white has 6. It's a rook and, and 2 pawns for 2 minor pieces. And this position is quite good for white. However, instead of playing knight c2 in this position, white, black can play bishop e2. And after bishop e2, c takes d4, bishop takes c4, rook c1, bishop a6, rook takes c7, e takes d4, and knight a3. And this position is another balanced equality, where black is up a pawn, but this pawn is going to be falling soon. But white's rook, what, the black bishop is better than the white knight, and white's rook will soon be exchanged off. And this position is about equal. But with all of that said, after bishop g4, I don't really recommend you playing bishop takes f6 in this position. Mainly because the c2 pawn is so weak. I recommend just play queen d2. And it looks strange because it allows knight takes c4. But here's where all the fun comes in. After knight takes c4, if you're playing a blitz game, you can shock your opponent by playing bishop takes f7. And what does this move do? If you play king takes f7, then f takes e5 is a check. And if you play this, then black's best move will actually be to play knight f3 with counter check. Now, this is looking crazy, but it's fun. After rook takes f3, if you play bishop takes f3, then queen d5 check will be played. Attacks the king and now you're winning the queen. This means that the rook cannot be taken. However, black has the move king e6, which still holds the draw. And here, white only has one move to keep the advantage. So, if you can find that move, congratulations. But what should white play here? Okay, if you found the move, congratulations, because this move is extremely hard to find. White's best move in this position is rook e3. And the main reason why this move works so well is because after something like knight takes d2, you can play e takes d6 check first. And then you can take the queen. And why is the position better? Because after something like rook takes d8, and notice, if you play knight takes b1, white can escape with his bishop by playing bishop b7 check. And then rook takes b1. Notice that all of this has been pre-calculated, so back then, in the, let's say, 20th century, this position might have been hard to spot with engines. But rook e3 has one downside, only one though, and that is knight takes g5. But in this position, you must find another strong move, queen d4. Attacks this bishop, after bishop f5, e takes d6, king f7, and all of a sudden, after queen f4, this bishop is dropping. And after this bishop is dropping, the rooks come to e7, so g6, then there's rook e7, and that's not working out. And other than that, there's no really good move for black. Black can try king g6, but then there's a move h4. And as you can see, there's all this chaos going on. And if you're in a blitz game, you can pretty much see that this is going to be much easier to play as white. So that's where all the chaos comes in. And this is why 
in this position, Black cannot play knight takes c4. Otherwise, he will have to go into all that chaos. But here, instead, Black can play bishop e6. And here, White can play bishop d3, protecting e4. And this position will be a calm position where Black will still be able to White will still be able to take on f6. And as you can see, this position isn't that bad for White at all. So that is the main repertoire for the Italian Gambit. It starts off here and white plays d4 and now this is going to be trying to win as white and this is how this is the Italian Gambit and it's one of the one of the sharpest lines in the Italian game and if you are successful with this in blitz then congratulations because this line is a complicated line and extremely hard to play. So I'll see you in the next video I guess and so I hope that you enjoyed this video. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.